monitoring, linking with science and people. And I am Joanne Hiles. I am the executive director of Friends of Deer Creek. I'm also the biologist. And I will be giving this webinar um, today. And I'm excited that, that you're all joining in. So first of all, um, I wanted to tell you about Friends of Deer Creek. Um, in general, we're a scientifically-based watershed group, meaning that all of our work is based on gathering scientific data. And we've been doing it this way um, for about 10 years now. We've been together a little bit longer, but the data part has been about 10 years now. And so what I'm going to do today is give you an overview of Friends of Deer Creek, some of the things that we've been working on, our projects, and um, our successes and our challenges, and really emphasizing um, the collaborative nature of our work. Um, that's, that's what we really credit our, our successes to. So I'm going to be, be emphasizing that. So um, those of you who don't know where we are, we're up here in northeastern California. Um, and uh, we are northeast of Sacramento. And we have a watershed that's about 34 miles long and ranges um, from about 3,500 feet up in this range down to the confluence with the Yuba River at about 700, 600 and something feet in elevation. So we have quite a varied um, watershed. Kind of a blow up of the watershed. And with our sites listed on it, these are our monitoring sites, same ones we've had for 10 years. So we have 10 years of, of monitoring data that um, we're looking at now and, and doing our work using for our work. And you can see we have a North Fork and a South Fork that come together at Site 1. And then we have some really interesting features in our watershed, like um, a, a dammed reservoir here. And then we have um, the town of Nevada City that has impacts. And as we travel downstream, we have the impacts of more and more um, humacs. And then another dam, um, Lake Wildwood, some of you might have heard of, um, with a reservoir and a big residential area. And the draining of, of um, it's down here from Penn Valley and then getting into um, joining up with the Yuba River. So these are some of the things that I'm going to be going over with you in a little bit more detail. Here are some of our major accomplishments over the last 10 to 12 years. Um, we have 10 years of water quality and um, benthic macroinvertebrate data, which we're feeling um, is now becoming very, very useful. Um, after all this time, we're able to see some of the trends and some of the things going on. Um, we have written and published um, two editions of a bug book, which is an identification guide I'll tell you more about. Um, we have five years of bacteria data from all of our sites. Um, we have done a Deer Creek Watershed Mercury Survey um, looking at um, is with concentrated mercury over the watershed. And we've, we've also done an EPA brownfield assessment um, which is some of the heavy metal contamination, other than mercury, but including mercury, all over the watershed. Um, we have been involved in a restoration project for most of those 10 years. So we started about eight years ago, and it's continuing. We're seeing some results of that now. Um, we have started doing a trail along Deer Creek, an eight-mile loop, and it's along with um, a bunch of restoration work. And um, we have completed a CRIMP and a coordinated resource, ma resource management plan with lots of stakeholders um, in the watershed and have been working under QAP uh, with the state all of these years and pretty much wrote the model um, QAP that, that is being used now. Um, and and um, all these things and more are collaborations with um, many, many different groups, states, federal, local, um, and project partners. Of course, challenges, many of them. Um, Deer Creek has um, an extensive mining legacy, which I'll get into with, with some of our data. And um, that, has, that has lots and lots of challenges um, 
in many ways. Um, we have water management and diversions in watershed and inv invasive species, many of those. Of course, land development increasing as we go downstream, so we're able to see how, how that impacts many, many, many things in our watershed. Uh, we have two wastewater treatment plants um, below, well, uh, quite a few, a mile or, mile or so below the first reservoir I showed you, and then right above, I mean, right below this, the Lake Wildwood Reservoir and the second, second one downstream. We have forest management and logging, excessive nutrient loading, um, bacteria can contamination all through the uh, watershed, and we have some private landowner issues. Um, that are popping up all the time, which I'll mention along the way. So um, all along here, we have been doing this citizen-based water quality monitoring. So science-based, so we are able to um, train our monitors and, and um, with all of our protocols and for all these things that are listed here on your screen, um, and go out monthly, they have their own sites, they're involved um, as community members in doing this work, and very, very interested in you know, our analysis of the data and um, how we're using it. So I think it's worked really well to have this partnership with our community um, for all these years. Some of our monitors, in fact, have kept their own sites for um, the entire 10 years. Uh, the results of the um, sampling come back to our lab, where we have a um, professional lab assistant and some trained volunteers who, who help her um, process the data. And of course, we're running, we're operating under the QAP approved by the State Water Resources Control Board. So here's an example of how we might look at our data. This is pH um, over the last 10 years that's been combined. Um, in this box plot, and um, the line in the box in here is the median, and then the box represents 25 to 75% um, of the data, and then the whiskers are um, 10 to 90%, and the dots are 5 to 95%. So you can get an idea of where the median is, and and then the visibility of the data, and you can see we're starting upstream here at site one, moving downstream as we get to site ten. Um, so in general, you can see that there's a change in this pH, um, with some some interesting results here at, at site eight. Um, and so what what we discovered pretty early on that was going on here is that. Um, uh, in, uh, you know, an increase in impacts as we go downstream, and one of those is with nutrients. And so the higher nutrients are coming as we get more um, impacts, including a wastewater treatment plant that is located right here near, um, right here, and at site seven, right, right above site seven. And so we get a lot of nutrients coming in, and. And um, then we have um, algae that take in the nutrients. There's algae blooms. The algae takes in carbonic acid. They, they need it to photosynthesize. They take, take the carbon dioxide from the water in the form of carbonic acid. Taking out the acid causes the pH to increase. Um, and that's what we're seeing here, um, where we have extreme algae blooms. We've seen kills there. We have a huge problem um, at site eight. And you can see it's also quite variable depending on the season and so forth. So using this data along with our macroinvertebrate data, which I'll show you in a minute, um, we were able to get on um, the 303D list um, for impacted streams. And so um, we've been working on trying to um, improve the situation here. Okay, this is showing um, phosphate at our monitoring site. Same thing, starting from upstream, going downstream, and also with some tributaries in 1211 and 15 are tributaries. And again, you can see um, there are some areas that definitely show phosphate. Um, here is um, right 
where the effluent comes in from the wastewater treatment plant. Um, there's obviously phosphate in that effluent. Um, it's quite variable, again, when it comes in and, and when we're testing, um, when we find it. Um, but again, that's one of the nutrients that we're looking at that causes the algae blooms, and we see it at site 8. Um, that we're seeing the resulting increase in pH. Uh, 15 and 16 are on a tributary Squirrel Creek. There is not a wastewater treatment plant on there, and so you can see it acts as a control for us. Um, there's other influences, but not a wastewater treatment plant, not an, um, an effluent source um, for nutrients. But when we get back onto main stem on site 9, you can see that, again, we see a little bit of a dilution factor, but again, higher levels of, of phosphate are in our creek, and we definitely see the effects of that um, by algae blooms um, and a lack, of, a lack of macroinvertebrate diversity. With the county, um, Nevada County, here's one of our collaborations, and showed them that data and said, you know, there's a problem. We're seeing um, retention of macroinvertebrate diversity in numbers. We're, we're seeing fish kills. We're seeing algae blooms. We, we have our problems here. Um, what are we going to do? And so right here kind of in the middle of um, look, this is nitrate that we're looking at over time at that one site, site 7, right below the wastewater treatment plant. Right about here in time, they did actually install some equipment at the wastewater treatment plant um, at our urging and at because of our somewhat because of our data to reduce um, the nitrate amounts. And um, this is the, the graph after they have installed that um, that equipment, and we are yet to see a reduction in the in the nitrates. It's still a very steep curve here. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. A very steep curve here, um, in you know increases through time with the the nitrates. So we have not yet seen um, an improvement due to the equipment. I don't know if it's not functioning right or or what's going on yet. So um, we're still hopeful that um, improvements will be made so that we will not get some of these nutrients put in um, at that site seven where the uh, wastewater treatment plant is. We've also been doing our macroinvertebrate studies um, for these past 10 years and at all of our sites. Well, not all of our sites, a few sites we have, in, about 10 out of our 15 sites. We're adding a few more now. And um, we're very, very excited about our macroinvertebrate program, along with water quality monitoring. I think it tells us a lot of information about the health of our um, our watershed because these are the guys that are living in there, and so they, they take in from all sorts of things that we can't even think about. So we have our volunteers out there. They've been trained. Um, we were trained um, through the swamp protocol by Jim Harrington um, 10 years ago. And so we've been going out ever since then two times a year for our 10 sites. And we look at numbers and diversity. And as you can tell by this woman's face, we have a lot of fun doing it. It's really um, a great thing for all of our volunteers, all of our citizen monitors, to get in there and, and see what lives in there. And um, it's, it's quite exciting. It's a whole different experience um, to have living <laughs> organisms. Our conference room and office was um, turned into a lab. And that was done by volunteers. And so we have lab tables that were built. Um, I found these wonderful microscopes on eBay, also the, the lights. And so we have um, very good equipment that we were able to buy for not very expensive amount of money. Um, and um, we have sessions in our lab every Wednesday morning and every other Wednesday night with um, our volunteer um, macroinvert specialist, Sandy. And we get in there and we look at our samples, count them, identify them, and we've been doing that um, for 10 years. And a lot of our, a lot of our monitors, our ideas, are, have been with us all that time. And so they're getting quite good. They've been experts. Um, we, have, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this without um, our professional taxonomists that have helped us. I happen to have a friend who's a taxonomist and been, has been doing this for many, many years, and she, um, uh, Susan McCormick, really got us going and taught us everything that we know about, about ID, along with Wayne Fields. Um, so 
now we're feeling like um, we ought to share because we've learned so much through the years about how to do this as a citizen monitoring group, how to ID down to the family level, and, um, and keep this together. We decided that we wanted to share, and one way to do that was to produce this book that I mentioned earlier. Um, we just this week um, have received the second edition of, of our bug book in our office, and um, we are selling it for $95. You can order it um, with the number here on the screen. Um, and we're very, very excited about how it's turned out. It's basically a guide to all the families in the western region of the United States. Um, obviously, it's a focus um, on the Yuba Deer Creek watersheds, um, but we do have bugs that are shared all, um, all over the West. And in fact, um, we're selling books all over the country right now because of many, many of the families are common um, in the country. So the left page is kind of all the families. Is in, and you look at this page and kind of get an idea of, of what you want to look at, which chapter you want to go to, which is color-coded. And then on the right side here, you go to your family and you look through the bugs and each, each family has a bunch of pictures with um, descriptions of characteristics and drawings. Um, we had a volunteer artist um, do work and um, some of the, the artistry is really, really important and really makes it easy to identify some of the bugs. And we've had Susan and Sandy um, put this together along with some other volunteers and AmeriCorps members, putting this together in a really organized fashion. So that's very, very useful for beginners and intermediates with all sorts of tips and information and characteristics to help identify. Um, we're, we're now using this book in our training sessions. Um, as I will tell you later, Friends of Deer Creek is getting into a lot more training of other groups and um, government agencies and local agencies and state agencies in the identification of macroinvertebrates and the sampling procedures. And so um, we're using this book um, to help us with that training, um, also in schools and, and other, other fisher organizations and so forth. So what we do with our macroinvertebrate um, information after we get it identified, um, we plot it and look at different metrics. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the sensitive EP index. It's looking at ephemeropterans, copterans, trichopterans, um, orders, and those are the most sensitive ones. So we look at the percentage of those um, families um, divide the total number of families that we found in the sample, and then we're able to plot it here in this graph. And again, we're going from upstream site 1 to downstream site 10, and you can see a definite trend in those sensitive species and the, the, the numbers that we have as we go downstream. And there's lots of other things that we're learning here from this graph that I don't have time to go through some subtleties, but, but the real obvious things you can see here is a, a, a very big drop between Site 4 and Site 6. Um, we're now sampling at Site 5 to try to get a little more handle on what's going on in that distance between 4 and 6. It's been a bit of a mystery to us for a long time about what's happening here at Site 6, although we just discovered um, a bunch of, um, of equipment where someone is dredging in that, in that area and they've hidden it in the bushes. And so we're wondering if all these years that's been happening there and it's been affecting um, the macroinvertebrate diversity and numbers there. It's also a fairly residential area, so other things could be happening that we, we haven't discovered yet. Site eight, I've mentioned to you already before that that's the one that has a lot of problems due to nutrients. Um, from wastewater treatment plant. It's got a great reduction in the numbers and diversity of organisms um, there. We've seen fissiles. We know we have macroinvertebrate problems there. Um, 15 and 16 are at Squirrel Creek, and they have the influences again of that wastewater treatment plant or of a, of a dam. And so we see um, an increase in the numbers a little bit here. Um, and then um, 
back to Deer Creek on 9 and 10 where we do see a lot of the impacts um, of the wastewater treatment plant and other impacts, agricultural impacts from Squirrel Creek happening, happening here. The way that we use our data, we look at at what these macroinvertebrates, what groups they're in as, as feeders. This is the shredder index. Um, shredders are those that eat um, vegetation. They're eating um, leaves and other vegetation. And so again, you can see pretty obvious trend that's going on here. Some of it is because the habitat changes as we go from upstream to downstream. Um, a lot more trees, a lot more um, vegetation falling into the creek, different kinds of vegetation downstream, more chaparral, um, lower elevation type vegetation. So that's part of, of what we're seeing. But we're also seeing that there's less um, health, healthy riparian areas downstream, especially down in this Site 8 area where we had cattle that used to be grazing there, um, trampling vegetation, um, causing problems also with nutrients. And so um, we're working with the landowners there to, to change that. Um, and we're hoping we see a change in our, in our data, which we think we're seeing in the other um, indices um, that we're looking at. Um, same thing with sites 9 and 10, a lot of impacts um, at, at the riparian zone level. And, and um, so these are things that are giving us the data so that we know the priorities for our future restorations. Um, we're putting together a restoration plan right now with the Chayaka Maidu. It's one of our collaborations. And um, they're looking at our data. We're looking at some of the ideas they have for restoration. And we're coming up with, with the sites that are highest priorities. And obviously, um, we're looking at some of these that you can see with very low um, numbers of macroinvertebrates in some of these, these areas. I think I'll take a break here to um, listen to your questions. And um, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything, anything about the first, first section here. At least I hear whether it's working or not. <laughs> Do you want to have a question? I got you. I have a question. Oh, good. Um, this is Noelle from the Watsonville Wetlands Watch. Oh, hi. Hi. A little while ago, you um, you talked about the fact that your water quality got you onto a list, something like the VOCD list. Yes, three 3D, which can you is yeah, can yeah, you talk a Clean about Water Act has a section called the 303D section, which um, is for paired water bodies. And so um, every year, um, I think it's every year, sometimes it's every other year, um, state puts out a call for people who would like to share their data with their team to look at um, it, the most paired water bodies um, in the state. And so send in your data, they call you with questions, and when you get on this list, um, you go through a process called the TMDL list eventually, and that's total maximum daily load, which is a process by which you um, determine what is the normal amount of, what the normal pH should be, what's the normal amount of nutrients that would work in that watershed, and so that's kind of your target. Um, and you work to get to that target, hopefully with money that's um, gotten from other sources. Um, so the first step to that whole process is getting on this list, um, which is presented, um, which the data is presented to the state board. Okay, so on that list are, are different resources. Those different resources become available. Yeah, more and likely to different resources are more likely to become available. Right now, with the state um, in such a fiscal crisis, it's not as easy, but. Um, but yeah, more more resources do become available. I see. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. This is Najima, and I'm with the Morro Bay Volunteer Monitoring Program. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm wondering. It seems like my program does a lot of the same things yours does, and I'm just wondering if your QAPP is available anywhere. Um, yeah, that should be. I mean, I could definitely um, send that to you easily, but I think it also should be available. Eric might be able to answer this question better than I can um, on the the swamp um, uh, 
website, I would think that um, we would have the state board's QAMP and our guidance documents. But not individual claps, maybe. No, we do not have those. But uh, I'm willing to receive those from groups and put them onto our website. And or and or and if you would like to just you know send me an email. I'm going to have my email address at the end here. It's just Wan at friendsofdeercreek.org. Um, I'd be happy to send it to you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like, like to let everybody know solicitation for the, the 2012 303 list has been sent out. So we're already in, inviting folks to submit data for the next 303D revision. And, you know, um, anything that I talk about in this in this webinar, I'm happy to talk one-on-one um, -on -one with any of the participants, anybody that wants to. Um, if you want to give us a call, email me. Um, I will be happy to talk more about our process for the 303D listing. It was it was quite a, uh, an amazing process, actually, and um, firming about our data because there's a lot of questions asked about them, and it, it helps. It would maybe would help you to, to hear some of those those things that we went through to get your data up to up to par and, and so forth before before you get onto that list or try to get onto that list. So always always happy to talk to you about about any of this. So please please contact me. Any other questions? When? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is Beverly. I Who is this? Beverly Powell. Oh, Beverly. Hi. I posted a question in the chat area. I don't know if you can see that. You know what? I can't. Okay. So um, um, I just wanted to ask if you'd broken down the bug count um, land-based and water species on a on a total basis, total land-based, total water species. Land-based, that's as adults? or Because we are looking at larvae. Larvae stage in in the creek. Adults. No, we're just looking at larvae. Okay. Not looking at the adults. Sometimes. Right. Yeah, sometimes they get in there, yeah. but but what we're doing is we're just we're we're um, the protocol calls for um, putting our net in the creek and we rub um, the the substrate, the rocks on the on the bottom. Um, and we get the clingers um, and that hide in the substrate that are in the larval stage. Sure. Now we do identify some of the adults, but um, they counted in our in our metrics. You don't use beetles. Uh, you know what we do use, use beetles. Yeah. Those some beetles. Eric's checking up on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we do use beetles. Okay, sure. um, so yeah, so we really haven't done that because um, it's not we're not really sampling for the land organisms. Okay, I'm going to move on here, and then you guys can call me or email me with some more questions. I'll look forward to that. We've also been doing um, some fish extra stocking over the past few years, getting a handle on what's going on upstream versus downstream with fish, um, what types of species. That's been really interesting for us. Um, and we're just really um, beginning to see what's going on over the, over the last few years, and that's correlated to our macroinvertebrate work we're doing at the same time of year. One of the things that we're getting more and more to is bacteria um, work, and um, we were lucky enough to be able to purchase an IDEX, IDEX um, sealer so that we could do um, bacterial, bacterial sampling um, and, I, and analysis. Um, more easily and, and more cheaply. So we are looking at E. coli in all of our sites, and we have our monitors go out and take sample water samples and bring them back to the lab, and then we go through this process of sealing the um, the whole thing through this this process, and then um, identifying the amount of E. coli in each of our sites. The county, Nevada County, actually came to us and asked us to do sampling and analysis at certain areas that they were concerned about in our watershed. And so that's really developed into quite a partnership um, with Bactria. Um, and this is kind of what we're we finding out. Again, upstream to downstream, we're finding this is the percentage of samples that have been exceeding the U.S. EPA 
single sample maximum standard um, for E. coli. This is during the summer. So anything that's, you know, doing a red box here has gone really over what, what it should be um, in that area of the creek. So you can see that, um, you know, 40% of the time it's over the standard, 20% of the time it's going over that standard. That's a little a little scary that we're seeing that in so many sites in, in Deer Creek. It's very, very hard to figure out why. But then there's this one, Site 15, which is, you know, over 70% of the time in this summer summertime showing an exceedance. And so we've been working really hard with the county to um, put postings because it's a swimming hole there. Um, to try to figure out what's going on um, in this area. And um, we've come to, to think is that there um, is a lot of ag, um, agricultural things, cattle, um, goats upstream from there, and so we're thinking that they're getting into the creek, um, and when they defecate into the creek, the E. coli gets in there. And so we're applying for money right now um, to be to work with the um, – the farmers were wanting to work with the RCD Agricultural Commission to work with them to try to figure out the best way to reduce um, uh, the cattle, the amount of time that the cattle get into the into the fields, and the amount of runoff that's coming off of the lands into the creek. So we're excited to start that collaboration really, really soon. Um, and again, we're, we collaborate with the county to get some swimming advisories up, and we're going to do that in a few, a few other places too, uh, if, they, if we see, to, if we continue to see these problems. Also, do a lot of algae work, and which we have been doing for a while. Um, we've been looking at algae mass, the amount of algae for about five years now, and um, we're just about to start an identification. Um, Graham, and we're very, very excited about that because then we're going to get to find out a little bit more about the types of algae that we have, um, maybe look at some native versus non-native um, questions that we have, and also um, understand um, you know, more about the health, along with the macroinvertebrates, knowing what types of algae you have and the sensitive, whether the sensitive species are there will tell us a lot more. Um, about what's going on at all of our sites. So again, I'll be quick here. Um, we're seeing, when we look at algae mass over time, these box plots, here's the meat here. We have a problem at sites eight and nine. Those are getting familiar, like familiar um, sites to all of you by now, um, as I told you before, because we have nutrients from the wastewater treatment plant and it's causing these algae blooms. It's nice to see a consistency in our data. Um, um, with these measurements, um, now we've just got to work with the county to get this, this changed. Um, we also have been working with the county on um, control measures, so we're not getting as much nutrient flow off of the lands, and hopefully we're going to be able to work with some of the local realtors that these things, these erosion control measures will be handed out to people when they purchase property um, so they can learn from the very beginning how to best take care of their environment. I mentioned mining legacy on Deer Creek. It's huge. Um, it happened 150 years ago, but we're still seeing many, many of the effects, and a lot of our projects are related to this. Do storm sampling. We have money right now to do storm sampling where we're collecting or grabbing um, samples. We also have an auto sampler where um, we can get samples during storms. This last set of storms um, was wonderful. We got a lot of data. Um, we're looking at how um, mercury is traveling downstream during these storms and how it gets attached possibly to sediment algae complexes not only travels downstream, but travels over dams. Used to be thought that, you know, dams would be, you know, would be stopping this mercury from getting down into the delta. Well, um, our preliminary data is, is swimming out that that's not the, that's not the case. Um, we're seeing it traveling over the dams, and um, I think this last storm, after we analyze it, will really show us some of the uh, results um, uh, looking the same. Here is a graph showing um, some of that. Um, this is last year's algae over the dam um, data showing um, the mercury concentration 
region going with the increases in suspended solids, and we're seeing that um, the cherries have some higher sediment levels. They also have some of the highest levels of mercury concentration, um, and that's kind of consistent with some of other studies with mercury that it hasn't kind of washed out of those those areas yet from the mining times, um, and so we're seeing that it's still coming down those tributaries, being washed down down the creek, possibly always attached or often attached to sediment and and algae. Okay, since about any of that. Um, Stuff. We'll have to make it brief since I don't have very much time. But if anyone has a, a quick question, I can answer that. Okay, I'm going to move on with, with the caveat that I'd love you to, to contact me if you have any other things you want to talk about. Um, we're also doing other heavy metal contamination studies also related to the mining times, so looking at arsenic and lead. Um, cadmium and other heavy metal contamination in some of these waste rock piles, so these hot spots along the creek. And um, we've been working with the regional board. They've given us some um, sampling um, uh, money to, to do some of these samples. We've also had partnerships with BLM and USGS to sample some of the macroinvertebrates. Um, and fish to see how much of this mercury, um, how much of the mercury possibly, other, other heavy metals also, we haven't tested for that yet, but mercury is getting into the food chain, and um, so that's been really, really interesting. Methyl mercury, meaning that it's gotten into the food chain, this is how much we're finding in, um, in macroinvertebrates, and I don't have time to go over too much of the details here, but um, we're seeing that um, that there is um, mercury getting a methyl mercury that is being recorded in some of our sites. Some of it's quite high, and um, that is in the macroinvertebrate population. So we know when the fish eat the macroinvertebrates, it's getting in there, and then when humans eat the fish, um, we're we're also definitely gonna gonna see that um, that could be a problem. So we're we're part of that we're part of that uh, food chain. And we um, see um, that site six again, and then in Lake Wildwood, we're seeing high levels of methylmercury in fish, so the next level on the food chain. At Lake Wildwood, we know um, in reservoirs where we have um, less oxygen, deoxygenated conditions, um, mercury turns into methylmercury at a more rapid rate. Um, might require that those circumstances to happen, and so we are seeing fish there with with levels above the EPA action level um, of mercury, and so we're working with Lake Wildwood, um, the Lake Committee there, to um, think about what we want to do um, to ready and to warn people. They have a sign now um, down below the dam for fishermen that might be taking fish out of the lake, out of the reservoir. Um, have some money from EPA to do um, a brownfield study. This is about lead. We looked at five different sites, um, and we did find some of these other heavy metal contaminants in different areas along Deer Creek. This is at Providence Mine, um, where we found high levels of lead in red here um, along a part of trail that we're going to be putting in. So that was very, very interesting information um, for moving the trail a little bit and um, not exposing people to um, some of the lead. It will give us an opportunity to do some um, signage to talk about our mining legacy and, and talk about how long and what happens to these, um, these heavy metals over the years, how long they, they stay around. Um, so we also will see it as an educational opportunity. Also for the schools, um, we've been taking them out um, to these areas um, to teach them about the long-term effects. And those school children um, helping us get some of the non-native ivy out of the tree, um, and they're helping us with many aspects of our restoration along this trail that we are 
now building along with American Rivers and the Nevada County Land Trust um, and the city and the county. We're all partnering um, to this together. And it'll be an eight-mile loop again, as I, I mentioned before, with a lot of restoration along it, um, revegetating, taking out non-natives, putting in natives, educating our community, and a lot of um, school groups um, and classes to come out and help us um, with with aspects of it. We've already done some really really neat projects with them, um, trying to outcompete some of the non-native um, blackberry by planting some willows. Um, and they were quite enthusiastic helpers. Here's um, part of our restoration, and this is um, work that American Rivers is leading along the trail. And there was quite a big berm on one of the areas you can see over here on to the right that was preventing the creek from accessing its floodplain. And so we got some metal equipment out there and um, did some work, and now it's, um, it's changed quite a bit. Bit. We're going to be working again with school kids and um, community members to replant this area. And now this, this part of the creek is going to be able to at least access its floodplain, get the nutrients it needs, um, and, and run in a more geomorphically um, healthy way. Um, we do definitely have some other work because this is a kind of an area where a lot of deposition happened with heavy metals. And so we, we have some more restoration work, but this was, well, this was the beginning. Using all this data that I'm that I'm showing you, lots and lots of ways. Um, as I told you about the 303D list, we're definitely using the data to um, to share with the state and, and talk about and try to figure out how to get out of the impaired listing for various things like pH. Some restoration sites. We look at our data. We choose the ones that are the most impacted. Also for evaluating the success of our restoration. You know, it's really to monitor before, during, and after for many, many years and see what happens. You know, we're, we're going to see our restoration site from eight years ago. We're starting to see increase in macroinvertebrate diversity there now. It's like, wow, so something worked. Something, you know, helped there. It's good to know we should do some of those things again. We need to educate community members, local, county, state, federal governments. Really powerful to have data. Data, numbers, thing, graphs, things you can really look at instead of just saying, you know, we really care about these organisms, that you're really showing a trend, you're showing numbers, you're showing lots of years of, of um, something happening. We're using the to convince people, county, state, to put up health warnings, I mentioned before, to do habitat assessments for CEQA. We're using our data that has been used for some of our CEQA um, for fish consumption um, and recreational activities. We're using some of our heavy metal um, data to um, perhaps change some of the trails around and because we're seeing um, that like arsenic can be breathed in by a bike rider or whatever. So we want to make sure that we're testing along some of the trails and seeing if there's any of the contaminants that might harm health. And also for mining assessments and cleanup. We did a brownfields assessment for the last few years. We're hoping to get money to do cleanups in some of these hot spots. So our data is definitely useful for convincing um, organizations, EPA in this case, that we need money for the cleanup. And um, the city and the county are involved with that too. Collaborations, I've been trying to mention along the way. Let me reiterate those. We We've been working with the county and state. Um, just recently um, begun a gravel augmentation project for improved salmon habitat in, in um, the lower reaches of Deer Creek. We're really, really excited about this. We're also working with UC Davis professors and, and researchers and, um, and other groups, and this is going to be full lots of collaborative work. of an interpret trail um, along, um, Jika have talked about, we're working a lot with Nevada City and BLM um, on that, and the Chakamaidu are um, going to do all the signage on one half of our trail to talk about some of the cultural um, impacts and some of the cultural uses of some of the plants and so forth. We're really excited about that. Partnership with the Regional Bird with a lot of our um, storm sampling and heavy metal contamination sampling. 
our yeah. various studies in conjunction with Nevada County Environmental Health Department. Education, we're working with the Department of Education and local educational bodies and schools working um, on restoration projects and environmental health projects. And USGS, all of our partnerships in um, heavy metal contaminants and other ways have been with them. Ethyl mercury getting into the food chain. Installed settlement traps um, on the storm chains within Nevada City. We did the research to show them that sediment was getting into the creek and this is what we needed. We provided money for the first few sediment traps and Nevada City is kind of taking the lead on doing some more and clean out and so forth. So we're working together really well on that. Working with little angler and recreational groups, talking about exposure to heavy metals and trying to figure out things that we can do to improve that together. Also working with the state on some of that stuff. Restoration projects. Um, worked a lot with Nevada City in our local park. It's been a wonderful educational experience for all of us. And, and of course, with the QAP, we worked with the State Water Board, and we are working now with them on a technical advisory committee with all of our data. They send a representative bill um, to come up and look at our data and give us guidance. So we're working together on all that. We're writing a restoration plan along Deer Creek with the Chayaka Maidu. Um, it's a collaboration that's been really, really um, wonderful. We learned a lot about Deer Creek from long, long, long ago, about things that um, we didn't know, and um, that's been wonderful. So our restoration priorities are going to be both cultural um, and from a different point of view. Future. We are going through a transition right now. Friends of Deer Creek is becoming, or going to have overseeing it, the Sierra Streams Institute, um, which will be an institute that we have actually already kind of been working um, through for years and didn't know it, but didn't have a name for it, where we're going to be training other groups, where we're going to be partnering with government agencies, um, where we're educating in schools, doing data analysis, being hired to do a lot of this work that we've been doing anyway. Um, and so we're going to get away from always depending on um, grants to do our work and getting some of it fun funded by, by doing our lab work for other, other groups and government agencies doing training um, and having consultants that come out and help um, all sorts of groups. So doing consulting, laboratory work, field studies, and education and outreach. Um, I will be hopefully sometime soon doing another webinar to, to tell you more about the Sierra Streams Institute and some of our, our ideas, um, but you're welcome to let me know through my website, um, through my email, and, or phone number if you're interested in anything in particular and, and if you have any questions about Sierra Streams Institute. But more information will be coming soon, I promise. So I don't know if we have any time, Eric, but I'd love to answer any more questions. If, we, just, um, we have a few minutes. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, we have here all my contact information, and I'd love to talk to any of you. Um, and, you know, this last thing about the Sierra Steams Institute, we really need to hear from a lot of groups, a lot of you, and, and what you're doing. If you just want to call me or send me an email about what you're doing, I really appreciated people who um, called in with your questions. I want to hear what you're doing, too. This is kind of a one-sided thing. This is, this is hard for me. I want to hear what you're doing. So email me um, or call and let me know what you're doing, and that will help us know what's needed out there um, for us, our Sierra Stevens Institute. If you're interested in a bug book or just finding out more about the macroinvertebrates, we kind of are going to do this custom training. Like if you just need a little bit of help or a lot of help or whatever, please um, just let me know um, what you're up to. And I, I really want to hear. I really want to hear from you. So thank you very much for, for being in. <laughs>